so our final presentator is uh, Tim Ingle, uh, which is chair of the social anthropology at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland. He has carried out fieldwork among Sami and Finnish people in Lapland and has written on environment, technology, and social organization in the circumpolar north on animals in human society and on human ecology and evolutionary theory. His more recent work explores environmental perception and skill practice. Ingalls' current interests lie on the interface between anthropology, archaeology, art, and architecture. His recent books include The Perception of the Environment in the year 2000, Lines 2007, Being Alive 2011, Making, who was mentioned by Ben in 2013 and the life of lions last year. So it's a, a pleasure for me to make this brief introduction to Tim. Okay, well my, my thanks too. It's, a, it's an enormous pleasure to be back in, uh, in Santiago and to be here on your, your beautiful campus in this quite wonderful building, so thank you for your hospitality. As an anthropologist and an academic, I am incapable of doing anything with my hands except write and play the cello. But having carried out ethnographic fieldwork in Lapland, I used to be able to manage a herd of reindeer, though maybe not anymore. And because of the nature of this fieldwork, I became steeped in the traditions of ecological anthropology, that is, in the study of the relationships between human beings and their environments, including everything that makes life possible. But I was also interested in the study of what is nowadays called material culture. Now, at one time, ecological anthropology and the study of material culture were so closely joined as to be virtually indistinguishable. But that's not the case anymore. Indeed, it seems to me that in recent years, students of ecological anthropology and students of material culture have been talking increasingly past one another. And this is very odd, given that both ecological anthropologists and students of material culture are broadly concerned with the material conditions of life, how life is materially possible. Ecologists say that we are embedded in a web of life comprising our relationships with all kinds of non-human organisms. Students of material culture say that we humans are embedded in complicated networks of relationships between persons and things. So we're all talking about relationships, about webs of life, about networks of persons and things, and yet we are speaking different languages. It has become popular these days to introduce so-called non-humans into the stories we tell about ourselves. And both ecological anthropologists and students of material culture have a lot to say about relations between humans and non-humans. But it turns out that they're referring to quite different non-humans. For ecological anthropologists, the non-human includes other animals, plants, the soil, weather and climate, sunlight, and so on. But students of material culture leave out all of these, and refer instead to artefacts, pure and simple. Indeed, they claim that any study of human beings must include all the artefacts with which we surround ourselves, <coughs> since it is the very fact that we concern ourselves so much with artefacts that makes us distinctively human. And actually, that's not entirely true, because many societies are not particularly bothered about artefacts, and a lot of non-humans are very much concerned with things like landscape and place. So the distinctions often made between humans and non-humans are not quite as reliable 
as they're commonly assumed to be. But to my mind, this is a symptom of a deeper problem which lies in the appeal to the concept of materiality. It seems to me that the emphasis on materiality in studies of material culture is getting in the way of a properly ecological understanding of the fields of force and the circulations of materials that make up the web of life. In talking about networks of relationships between people and objects, the materials, the forces, the circulations, the energy, all of that which makes life possible, have somehow been left out. And this is a problem that I've been trying to address. And immediately we hit up against a difficulty. What do scholars, philosophers, even practitioners actually mean when they talk about materiality or about the material world? Looking in the literature for definitions of materiality, I found that writers who use the word, although they tend to talk in very learned ways as if everyone already knew what it means, materiality, they actually have no idea. And they remind me of St. Augustine, who remarked in his Confessions that if you ask him what the time is, he can tell you. But if you ask him what is time, he cannot. And it's a bit the same with materiality. Suppose I have some stuff about me. It could be stone or metal or brick or whatever. Ask me what material do you have there? And I can tell you. But ask me, what is material? Or what is the materiality of that stuff? And I am confounded. If you ask an archaeologist, for example, what they mean by materiality, you're likely to get two quite different answers. They will say, on the one hand, that the materiality of a thing lies in its brute physicality. A rock is a rock is a rock. That's it. That's what the geologist studies. It's hard, it's solid, it's physical. But then on the other hand they will say, yes, yes, but the reason why we need a concept like materiality is so that we can understand how things like rocks or pieces of wood are appropriated by human beings within particular social and historical contexts. So materiality means at once the hard stuff in itself and the way that stuff is turned to account as means to various kinds of human ends. So there's a kind of duplicity in the notion of materiality in the way it refers at one moment to the stuff of nature and at the next moment to the way that stuff is appropriated by people in society. And in this duplicity, the concept of materiality seems to reproduce the division between nature and society. And that's a division that has proved extremely problematic in the social sciences recently, and that many of us have been trying very hard to dismantle. So in the notion of materiality, the world is presented to us both as a physical bedrock of existence and as an externality, a world out there, open to comprehension and appropriation by a transcendent humanity. And the notion of material culture is problematic for very much the same reason. We say, here's the material, here's the culture, put them together and we get material culture. Now, the logic of making, of, of taking a bit of material and taking a bit of culture some substance here and some form there and putting them together to create an artefact. This particular logic of making goes back, of course, to Aristotle. And long ago, Aristotle argued that if, for example, a sculptor wants to create a sculpture, then they begin with a lump of marble and in their head an idea of the form they want to create. It could be the image of a god or of a famous character, and then they chip away at the marble until the form of the marble comes to match the idea in their head. 
So it was Aristotle who argued that in making a thing you take a formless lump of material and an immaterial form and you put the two together. And as the classical Greek word for matter was hyle and the form was morphe, the idea that in making you combine matter and form came to be known as the hylomorphic model. And this notion of making, of imposing form on substance, has been around in the Western tradition of thought ever since and in, has become in many ways increasingly dominant. So I felt that the first thing we have to do is to deconstruct this hylomorphic model. And in this I found inspiration in the philosophical writings of Gilbert Simondon, uh, since they're written in French and are still largely untranslated into English anyway, Simondon's works remain rather little known outside his native France and haven't had the impact they deserve. But writing in the 1960s, Simondon was already arguing strongly against hylomorphism and he introduced a concept which he called individuation. And by this he meant that one should understand the generation of things, such as artefacts or objects or pieces of furniture, as a process of growth, that is, as an ontogenetic process. When we talk about, human, when we talk about organisms, including human beings, we say they grow, that is, they undergo a process of biological development. And the technical term for that is ontogenesis. All living organisms undergo ontogenetic development as they grow from the embryo or the unborn fetus to maturity. And Simondon was simply arguing that we really need to understand the generation of the forms of artefacts in the same way as an ontogenetic process in which form emerges out of that pro process. And to demonstrate his point, he chose as an example a kind of making that on the face of it would seem to conform to everything that Aristotle had said about hylomorphism, about making things by imposing form on matter. And his example was making bricks, brick making. Traditionally, in making bricks, you would cast lumps of wet clay into a rectangular wooden box. Now you'd think that this is a simple process of moulding. You have the mould, which is geometrically, geometrically regular, in a rectangular form, and then you have the formless raw material, the clay. You stick the clay into the mould, and the form is thereby imposed on the material, and you get a nice rectangular brick. But Simondon shows that this is not really what happens at all. For one thing, you have to prepare the clay. Well, first you have to dig it out from the soil and remove the impurities and pound it and knead it until it is sufficiently soft and supple to take to the mould. And then for another thing, you have to build the mould, which is generally carpentered from a hard wood, usually beech. It has to be a hard wood to take the pressure. So, Simondon argued, far from impressing form on material, what is happening is that two different processes, that is, of making the mould and of preparing the clay, are brought together at a certain point. And instead of an imposition of form onto matter, what we actually have is the contraposition of equal and opposed forces imminent in the clay and in the mould so that the form of the brick emerges as a kind of transitory equilibrium or equilibration which is then held in place because the brick is subsequently fired. Now although Simondon's work is relatively little known, it, it has been taken up very enthusiastically by the philosopher Gilles Deleuze and psychoanalyst Felix Guattari, especially in their book Mille Plateaux in English a thousand plateaus. And here they argue against the hylomorphic model precisely on the grounds that it starts off from the idea of a fixed form, that's the form you are supposed to have in your mind, 
an entirely and an entirely homogeneous raw material. And making Sadler's and Guattari is not like that. For one thing, the form is not fixed, but varies in all kinds of ways. And for another thing, no material that anybody ever works with is homogeneous. And one of the examples they use is splitting wood. When you take an axe to split a log, you're not imposing a form on the log. What you're doing is finding the grain, and then the axe or the wedge will follow it, and the line it follows is one that has already grown into the wood when it was part of a living tree, as part of its process of growth. It's rather like if you tell a story, you decide to open the book at a particular page and read on from there. So the acts decides what page you're going to open, but then the story takes over. So the material that you are working with is not formless, nor is it homogeneous. It already has lines of growth. It has a grain. And the maker is not someone who is imposing form on material, but rather one who finds the grain and then bends it to an evolving purpose. And this, I think, is what making is all about. Not imposing form on material, but finding the grain of the world's becoming and then turning it this way or that in order to make it match what your own evolving purpose as a designer or maker might be. So Deleuze and Guattari argue, and, and I agree, that the artisan, the maker, the craftsperson, is a person who has to follow the material, that is, to follow the way it goes. And in following it, they are guided by an intuition in action. But this leads us to another question, and that is, well, what is a material? How can we say what a material is? And that's a very difficult question to answer. It's easy to say, oh, that's wood, that's metal, that's pewter, that's tin. But what are we talking about? What is wood? What is tin? What is pewter? What do we mean when we speak of materials? Now, the scientific chemist, of course, will think of matter in terms of its invariant atomic or molecular constitution. So water, they'll say, a symbol. Water is two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom. Salt is a sodium atom, sodium atom linked to a chlorine atom. Wherever you have water or wherever you have salt, you have these atomic combinations. But water, we've already heard about, it's an interesting case in point. The molecular structure of water, H2O, couldn't be simpler. And yet the properties of water, what water does under different conditions, are still so complex as to defy full understanding. No one yet actually knows why you slip on the ice. It used to be said that, that uh, the pressure of your foot on the ice is enough to melt the ice just underneath and that makes a slippery surface. But as Chris pointed out, actually you'd have to be an extremely heavy person to put enough pressure on the ice to do that. So nobody actually knows why ice is slippery. And there's a lot we don't understand about chemically the simplest materials. They remain beyond our comprehension in terms of what they actually do. So the maker is less like a scientific chemist than an alchemist. I've noticed both in my own work and in the work of many colleagues, that as we become more interested in materials themselves and in what they do, we are also beginning to think more like alchemists and to have greater respect for what the alchemists achieved. Because they were not so much interested in what a material is. They wanted to know what it does, what happens to a material when you mix it with other materials or heat it up or cool it or treat it in particular ways. And this is also what a cook wants to know. A cook, experimenting in the kitchen, puts different ingredients together and looks to see what happens to them if you heat them or boil them or freeze them or cool them down. So the maker, working with materials, is like an alchemist. He's interested not in what the materials are, but in what they do. 
In short, materials are what they do. So to define or specify a material is in a way to tell a story, a story about what happens to it when it is treated in particular ways. For example, gold. Gold is an element in the periodic table and the chemist or the scientist would define it as such. But if you are an alchemist, you might say that gold yellows and gleams, that it shines ever more brightly under running water, and that it can be hammered into thin leaf. <coughs> now, in the 1960s, the craftsman and furniture designer David Pye proposed a distinction between what he called properties the properties and the qualities of materials. He argued that the properties of materials are given in what they are, say they have a particular density, weight or tensile strength which can be established through careful scientific testing or experiment. But the qualities of materials, by contrast, he said, are ideas in people's heads. We ascribe certain qualities to things but these are merely products of our imagination. But that distinction between properties and qualities only reproduces the division between mind and matter, which is the one we want to try and get away from. So I think it's better, if we're concerned with the properties of materials, to think of these properties as belonging to the knowledge of practitioners that comes from a lifetime of experience of working with them. And this means that when we talk about the properties of materials, they are really stories of what happens to them. In a sense, we could say that materials don't really exist, rather they carry on or perdure through time. So every material, in a way, is a becoming. It's not an object in itself, but a potential to become something. So to describe a material, I think, is to pose a riddle. It is a riddle that gives the material a voice. And then the answer is discovered by observation and engagement with what is there. Medieval texts are full of riddles of this kind, and I could make one up for you, and it would go like this. I yellow and gleam. I shine ever more brightly under running water. Hammer me, and I will get thin. What am I? The answer, of course can be found simply by observing, by looking around in the world and finding what answers to that description. We call it gold, but we don't need to have that word at all. We know what we're talking about through observation, through engagement in the world. So the artisan, the craftsman, the maker, is someone who has to be ever observant to the movements of stuff around him, and has to bring that the movement of his or her own attention or awareness into line with the movements of the surrounding materials. So making something is a mode of questioning and response in which the maker puts a question to the material and the material answers to it. The maker puts another question, the material answers again, and so on and so forth. Each answers to the other. And I use the term correspondence to capture this mutual responsiveness. So in making, the maker follows the material, and that process of following the material is a correspondence between the flow of the material and the movement and flow of the maker's attention. One could perhaps draw the flow of material as one wavy line, and the flow of awareness or consciousness as another running roughly parallel. And so correspondence is a matter of bringing these two lines into agreement. Or, or to adopt a, a musical analogy, it's like two lines of melody responding to one another in counterpoint. What I'm against is the freezing of the flow of materials in the form of an object and the freezing of the flow of attention in the form of an image, leading to the idea that making is an interaction between image and object. Because for me, making is not about images or objects at all. It's about the coupling of awareness and of movements and gestures 
with the forces and flows of materials that bring any work to fruition. And the important thing to recognise about these flows is that they don't connect things up. Or to adopt a helpful metaphor from Deleuze and Guattari, imagine a river flowing between its banks. You can imagine one place A on one side of the river and another place B on the other side, and you could build a bridge and cross from A to B. But the flowing water of the river doesn't go from anywhere to anywhere else, it just keeps flowing along between its banks at 90 degrees to the line between A and B. So A and B, the bridge across the river, but that way the river is flowing. So it doesn't go <coughs> across, it goes along. So it's to these flows that we need to attend if we're to understand making. And whereas the lines we might draw between objects or between objects and persons are lines that connect, like the line across the bridge from A to B, the flow lines of materials and attention do not connect but entangle. They comprise not a network but what I've called a meshwork. And to shift from talking about objects and their relations to talking about materials and their entanglements is equivalent to a shift from a network view to a meshwork view. And I think this meshwork view corresponds very closely to the ecologist's idea of the web of life. And it means that we have to distinguish not only between objects and materials, but also between objects and things. This word object is very problematic. It's a word that many of us would like to be able to put to one side. It's a problem, firstly, because you think, well, where there are objects, there must be subjects. And this subject-object dichotomy has raised a host of difficult issues, not least that of the Cartesian split between mind and body. Most philosophers are agreed that the dichotomy subject-object has to go. But there are many rival philosophical camps, and each camp, while claiming to have solved the problem of how to get rid of the dichotomy, accuses its rivals of merely reproducing it in its own discourse. And for the onlo onlooker to these arcane philosophical debates, it is all very tiresome. Everybody is accusing, get, saying, we've got rid of the subject-object dichotomy, but you lot over there are simply reproducing it. And they're saying, no, we've got rid of the subject-object dichotomy, but you lot over here are simply reproducing it. And you think, what on earth is all this about? It doesn't seem to get anybody anywhere. And to my mind, however, the problem with the object, as indeed with the subject, lies not in the ob or the sub, but with the ject. It implies, because ject, it comes from the word to throw, and ject means thrown. It implies an entity that is already thrown, already cast, in a fixed and final form. So it confronts us, face to face, as a fait accompli. But when we talk about materials, on the other hand, they are always becoming. Everything is something but being something is always on the way to becoming something else. And materials, if you will, are substances in becoming. So, the move from a focus on objects to a focus on materials is equivalent to a shift from a philosophy of being to a philosophy of becoming. And gatherings of materials in movement are what we call things. Now, this distinction between objects and things goes back to the philosophy of Martin Heidegger. And for Heidegger, the object is out there. It's a fait accompli. You are over against it. The thing, by contrast, is to be understood as a gathering of materials in movement. So to touch or observe a thing is to bring the movements of our own being, or rather becoming, into correspondence with the movements of the materials. It's to create an entanglement, a knot, out of these different material flows. And the final point I want to make is that if we think of things in that way, as gatherings of materials in movement, 
then we are things too. People, we, us, are living organisms, and as organisms we too are gatherings of materials in movement. In fact, we are entire ecosystems. I believe that according to the latest studies, it's shown that 90% of the cells in the human body actually belong to various kinds of bacteria, but that's another story. As gatherings of materials, people are a bit like compost heaps. If you were to take the lid off a human being, you would see a writhing mass of activity going on beneath, like the writhing worms in a healthy heap of compost. And the thing about living bodies, human or non-human, is that they are sustained because they are continually taking in materials from their surroundings and discharging materials into the surroundings in the processes that biologists call respiration and metabolism. Or quite simply, to live we have to breathe, we also have to eat, and we also have to defecate. And the organism can only keep on going because of this continual interchange of substance across its outer membrane or skin. Or quite generally, things perdure. That is, they can carry on because they leak, because of the interchange of materials across the ever-emergent surfaces by which they differentiate themselves from the surrounding medium. The bodies of organisms, and indeed of other things, leak continually, and indeed their lives depend on it. And in my view, this shift of perspective from stopped-up objects to leaky things is what ultimately distinguishes what I want to call an ecology of materials from mainstream studies of material culture. Thanks. So, thank you, team. It's time for questions. A few questions, and then you come here or all together? All right. Then, then we'll come up. Okay. Let me just uh, say that maybe the questions could be in Spanish, and oh, we, we can translate. Yeah. Yeah. So may, maybe some other people would take courage to, to ask questions. Please. <laughs> yeah, Georgia. Hi. Um, thanks very much, Stephen. I was thinking about the uh, analogy between the uh, sample of the compressor and the one that the baseman used about um, yeah. system theory. Yeah, also with the, also with the woodcutter. Yes, yeah. it's yeah. also about woodcutting. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, it seems there's something there that is quite interesting. So my question was whether we could, we could include in the uh, responsiveness of Materials acting as intermediaries, that this is mm. like iron and how they uh, take in terms of uh, properties and qualities of the uh, materials. Yeah, okay. I, mean, I, I, think, I think everything I said would be entirely consistent with Bateson's view, but I think that Bateson in um, has, has just sort of one, in that particular example, has just one side of the picture. Um, just for those who don't know it, um, Bateson, Gregory Bateson, in, in Steps to one of the chapters in, in uh, Steps to an Ecology of Mind, uh, uh, uses the example of a, a woodcutter who is cutting a tree with an axe. And um, his point, he, he's, he's arguing that the mind is not something that's uh, inside the skull, that it, it flows out into the environment and back along processing loops. And the loop that is involved when you're cutting a tree with an axe is it go... Um, which, depends which bit you start. You start, you're, you're going uh, down the hand through to the handle of the axe to, the, uh, to where the axe is, strikes the wood, where you're making a notch in the wood because you're cutting it that way. And then it, it loops back because you are also observing with your eyes through the visual system 
in here again and back out through the arms. So you've got a processing loop that goes brain, arm, hand, axe handle, axe blade, notch, visual, observation of notch, eyes, brain. And, and so he's got, now that's a, a, a loop of what I would call attention, uh, bodily, uh, bodily attention. So, so he's got the flow of attention there. That, that, but what, what he doesn't actually talk about precisely there is, is what's going on with the wood. Uh, we know that, there's a, that, that a notch is being cut, but um, the, obviously the, a, a, a skilled woodcutter knows a lot about the grain of wood, exactly where the notch should be cut and how deep it needs to be <coughs> and at what angle. Uh, and, and that's where you begin to bring in the, 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 the properties of, of the wood itself, uh, uh, which you would have to then tell a story about that particular species of tree and how it grew and the climatic conditions of its growth. So, so Bateson just gives us half the picture there. Um, if he were here, he would quite happily say, I'm sure, that yes, of course, you need the other half. <laughs> Christian? Thank you, Tim. Um, my question is about the Anthropocene. How, how this um, ecology could speak to the Anthropocene? I think um, this is to... to for the benefit of everybody, things we've, we've been discussing already a bit today, um, uh, the the big the sort of contradiction that we've discovered in our discussions at the heart, or one of the many contradictions at the heart of the concept of the Anthropocene, is that whilst it's presented as a new era, a new period in the geological periodization of history, so it's the Eocene, the Miocene, the Pleistocene, I'm leaving some out. Eocene, Miocene, Pleistocene, Holocene, Anthropocene, how many have I, 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 I can't remember, how many I've left out, but, but, but there's a geological periodization of history. Um, and yet one of the things that we think, I think, I think our colleagues too, are thinking about the Anthropocene, or Anthropocene thinking, is that it leads us to reject that sort of periodization and to tell the story of the Earth and its materials in a different kind of way, and in a way in which everything there is is carrying along mm. over a period of time. So instead of instead of thinking stratigraphically, instead of thinking in terms of, of superimposed strata, as for example in that diagram from Harris that you showed, uh, we are thinking in terms of, of 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 a continuous movement. It's it's as with the with well, using that example of the bridge across the river and the flow of the river. It's as though we're inverting our picture, our stratigraphic picture, we're inverting it by 90 degrees and talking about things that could go along. So that sort of anthropocenic discourse actually disrupts the idea of a periodization of, of history and makes us think that perhaps the Anthropocene is not really a new thing at all. It's rather a recognition of things that have been going on all the time. Uh, it, 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 it's that, that things that have happened or are happening uh, in the planet at the moment um, have forced us to recognize what has been going on all along. Tim, let me ask you a, maybe a panel question. but. When you were talking, I was thinking about the 3D printers. Mm -hmm. Do they make things or objects? Well, I, 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 it's a good question, I, I, because I, I don't really understand about 3D printers. My, my, my feeling about 3D printers was that, was that these are, uh, are built precisely according to the hylomorphic model. Uh, that, that um, after all, when we use a 2D printer, when we're mm -hmm. just working on, com on our computer, we, we compose a text and then we put it online and press a button and the machine just does it and it, it comes out so that all the work has been in the, in the composition and the printing is just, just a mechanical thing. And, um, and my worry about 3D printing is that it actually reinforces that division between uh, intellectual labor and, and, and manual labor and reduces the, the actual making of the thing to a purely mechanical operation. It will re-intellectualize craftsmanship and I... I I feel that as a concern, but but then other people tell me who know about 3D printers that it's not really like that, 
um, for one thing, I suppose there's all the knowledge that goes into making the printer itself and making it function and so on, but, but that, that actually um, I've got that too simplified a view mm -hmm. of, a, of a 3D printer and it's a much more crafty thing than you might think. And I really don't know because I've never used one um, and I can't tell, but it's an interesting question. Please. So maybe back to the question of the Anthropocene. Um, it seems that we've been um, uh, thinking in terms of extend, uh, extensive properties uh, from the thermodynamics, dividing everything in space. And by listening to your uh, thoughtful contributions, uh, it might be a time to shift from those uh, divisions uh, in matter, in volume, to more uh, intensive properties such as temperature, movement, yeah. speed, and you know, see 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 the mountain as in, as an inspiration, you know, the geology of morals rather than the genealogy of morals. Um, I was wondering what would be your relation to uh, the intensive properties of thermodynamics and also to the theory of assembly. As these emergent units yeah, uh, that's a, coming to interaction. That's a that's a big one. On 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 <coughs> on thermodynamics um the the you know there there's the classical argument, it, it goes back to Sh to Erwin Schrödinger, I mm -hmm. think, that um that order can be maintained in the universe, for example, in the form of li living organisms, only by sucking out a certain amount of entropy that is disorder from the environment, and, and that, that, that takes up energy, and, and there an, always has to be a, a net uh, surplus. of. If, if you, the, the, more or, the more order you <coughs> maintain, you, the, you, there's a little bit more disorder that you have to create somewhere else. And, um, and the, the the, the problem about that, as I understood it, is that um, that there's a certain degree of a certain lack of clarity about what we mean by um, order and disorder. This is this is where we're, if, taking the concept of entropy as being absolutely a key to to thermodynamics. Um, uh, it has been argued that a molecule of DNA which is supposed to be providing all this order, is actually a thoroughly disordered molecule because it's a complex one and you've got so many different substances mixed up. In a really ordered universe, in thermodynamics terms, we'd have all the carbon atoms over here, all the oxygen ones over here, all the phosphate, phosphorus ones over here, in neat piles, not all mixed up. But actually, the sort of order that biologists are talking about in complex molecules are, are thoroughly disordered in thermodynamic terms. So there's a degree of confusion there that I, I'm not sure has ever been resolved. With the assemblage, um, I, uh, I, 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 actually, I actually don't, don't like the concept of assemblage very much, although everybody's using it. Um, and it all hinges on, this is something I, I don't want to, to say too much because, uh, because I got to talk about this on Thursday, but um, <laughs> there's, a, there, there's a different, I was talking about correspondence, about the way in which things move along with one another as in musical counterpoint. And the theory of the assemblage is all about and, and it's, it's a question of whether we say that things, the, 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 the the universe is one thing and another and another and another and another along ever-extending rhizomatic uh, networks, or whether we say that the universe is one thing with another, with another, with another, with another, in which case you've got lots of, lots of going along. So I can't, I can't think of a piece of polyphonic music, for example. It has parts. And the cellist will say, I'm playing the cello part, and the violin is saying, I'm playing the violin part. And perfectly all right to talk about parts, but I can't see the piece of music as an assemblage because those parts are not being joined end to end, but are going along together. And for that reason, I think we need to make a distinction between the and and the with. 
um, between assemblage and correspondence. And in that sense, I want to go a little bit beyond assemblage theory, which as it stands, I think, glosses over that difference. Okay, I think it's time to invite the rest of the mm -hmm. presenters. So, Andres, Chris, Ben, please. <coughs> so we can have a, a final discussion on the solid fluids in the Anthropocene. How much time do we have? And I... No, I have a couple of questions. Yeah. We can... Or does it matter if we go over the it doesn't, it doesn't matter. No, we haven't done this. It's not okay. I think this, this question of the relation of... Anthropocene with the ideas you have shown us, I think it could be a, a kind of question for all of you. you know, going back to the main theme of, of our workshop. Yeah? So maybe just to start a, a few words on, on, on this. It's the age of humans, according to the, another way of telling Anthropocene, but we heard here that uh, lichens and, and seals, whatever, are part of the Transformation of, of the world. I think so. <laughs> I, I'm, 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 I've been thinking about what you just presented to, and uh, I wonder whether there will be limitations to the scale we can work on with, with, with this ecology. The whole endeavor of the Anthropocene is a planetary mm -hmm. thing in which we all seem to be in the same boat. Mm -hmm. which is sinking. <laughs> mm -hmm. So my feeling is that um, the ecology, which makes perfect sense, <coughs> and it, um, it offers answers to, to some of the problems. And I mean, some people have been talking about downscaling and, and those, all those things. I wonder whether, whether um, it's fundamentally incompatible with, with, with the concept itself, seen as this <coughs> global Problem. Yeah. Well, 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 well it, 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 this all depends on what, how we understand the globe, uh, and whether whether we think the globe is is is, is kind of one big ball, uh, and that's what connects us because we're all stuck on this ball, or whether we think of it as something a bit more like a, a, a cosmos in the in the um, classical sense. Uh, which is something that we're not all sort of stuck around on, on, on the outside, but we're actually um, inhabitants. And that, that cosmic view means that, in a sense, we're all at the centre of our own cosmoses, but they're all kind of overlapping with one another, and therefore you can't say, where does mine end and yours begin? So we're all, we're all folded in. We're all folded in on one another, so that instead of thinking of this, as this, this globe as a planetary entity, which is so still so dominant in mainstream science, um, the thinking of the planet as this, as this globe here and of other planets that we might go and move mm. to, you know, Virgin, <laughs> or go on tourist trips <laughs> to, to other planets. That if, but if we stop thinking, I, I think um, that if this kind of ecology is going to work, <coughs> then we have to stop thinking about the world we inhabit in that uh, global, spherical way and think about it more as, as a cosmos. Um, oh, Augustin Berk, in, in his writing on the landscape, um, has shown or argues that there's been a transition in, historically in, in European thought uh, from talking about the cosmos to talking about the universe, <coughs> and, and that that, mm. that movement from cosmos to universe is also a movement that, in which humans have been gradually sort of taken out of the picture. So, so when we used to have just the cosmos, we now have humans and the universe. Mm -hmm. And I think and that's what we need somehow to overcome to get back to a cosmic picture, in my view. Can, can I bring you that same thing? That is that the, I feel that, in a way, um, because we know about the Anthropocene through the science, and the science has been mainly about having an outside view mm. of the Earth. Mm. So I wonder whether the Anthropocene could actually exist. I was reading something, um, Bruno Latour, 
wrote um, an anecdote about an uh, um, environmental chemist talking about not just one carbon, but multiple carbons, like a proliferation, where, where, where even, <coughs> even the material um, dimensions will, will, will multiply. Um, yeah, I wonder, I wonder whether there's a, a contradiction in terms of... of well, I think, I, th I think there is, in the sense that, that, it, that in, in one sense, the Anthropocene is, a, is an idea that's been given to us from science. It's yeah. That's where it's, where it's come from. And yet many of the discourses that it's generated have been from the arts. They've been very critical of, of mainstream science. So the, there's a tension. That tension is there right in the, the discourse <coughs> itself. And it goes down as far as saying, is, is, is an atom of is carbon mm -hmm. here the same as carbon there? Yeah. Uh, and uh, there would be good arguments to say uh, that it isn't. Mm -hmm. um, just as in... One, one, one sort of model to think about it, I think, is in terms of, in, in, in medicine, about the ways in which antibodies fasten onto their host cells <coughs> in curing a disease. Mm -hmm. um, and and, and the biologists tend to use a kind of lock and key metaphor. You know, here's, the, here's the cell that, um, the, or the virus, rather, that, that's mm -hmm. carrying the disease. Here's the antibody that will fit in to lock in to the, to, to the virus and neutralize it and, and render it harmless. And yet I think it turns out that, that this, the fit is always an approximate one. Mm. That, um, I mean, it usually works if it's a good thing, but, but the virus is sort of this way and that way and antibiotics a bit. So if we get a rough kind of fit, but it's always going to be, it's always going to be variable, as, as variable as when you go to the tailors mm -hmm. and, and you're trying on uh, a, 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 a suit mm. and uh, the suit is made, made, made for some kind of average person who doesn't exist mm. but you, you try and find, find the best fit mm -hmm. and, and then, the, then the clothing once you've worn it for a bit kind of fits itself around you and, and, and if that's the way the universe is, is made then you know, imagine you've got water H2O and you you're just happen to be trying to fit some hydrogen oxygen atoms to a couple of a couple of hydrogen atoms to an oxygen atom to make water but well I, they, they, you'd say well, this, this, this oxygen atom seems to be okay I think I'll join onto that one and, and, and so you create a molecule of water which is quite different from every other molecule of water I don't know but it, it, it's like people saying is the, is the speed of light actually constant who knows <laughs> Um, to respond to your question, Javier, um, I think I would fully agree that the concept of Anthropocene itself seems to contain within it the seed of its own dissolution, uh, which is probably a good thing. But um, so you have, uh, this is how it relates to my own work, just thinking about the uh, proliferation of these relationships between humans and so called non humans. Retrojecting that, as I said in my paper, through time, so we can actually not just to kind of get a better idea of what's going on in the past, but in order to create new sense of things like temporality. Right. So this is the other question that Tim, you know, the other critique, that the <coughs> scene is a period of time which challenges the notion of periods of time in a particular way. So if I'm an archaeologist and I'm this, this r radically reorienting <laughs> what it is I think I'm doing, or part of what it is I think I'm doing. Um, also, the proliferation of materialities, as Tim says, again, the um, multiple carbon atoms, so forth, all the things that we've released and done, begs the question of materiality, or, of, or what are they, materials, what are things. Uh, that, again, is something that I will investigate. Um, archaeologically, and it does, it occurs to me that the Anthropocene is supposed to be this, it is, it is a global phenomenon, right? That's half the point. Mm. However, it demonstrates, again, the inadequacy of the notion of the global, or the importance, at least, of the notion of local um, materialities or material existences, local histories, local archaeologies. Um, because that's what it begs that we, that we look at these things. So in terms of archaeology, I think um, we will, I will have to reorient projects around 
discovering processes that are no longer fit time in the traditional way, no longer fit the subject of our guild humans in the traditional way, uh, where materi materiality or materials are up for grabs. Uh, so a radical difference for archaeology, but the kind of comeback is that all of this work in archaeology should lead back to a further critique of what it is we're doing now, if what we're discovering has any relevance whatsoever, or is it, are we simply discovering what we already know, which I do not. So it'll generate conceptual kind of work as a consequence. Yep. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I would say that I uh, keep thinking something that Tim said, that Anthropocene is an opportunity to uh, create a space uh, for try to establish a dialogue between uh, different signs that generally speak different language. Mm -hmm. So the possibility to discuss time, to discuss solid, fluid, or even to create a solid fluid, mm -hmm. or uh, materiality versus uh, materials, or properties of materials. So there are different ontologies, and all are around this concept of Anthropocene. So in, in this sense, I think it's uh, really uh, an interesting opportunity to start discussing this case anthropology and archaeology, but also to uh, integrate more disciplines. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm just to chime and to see how beautiful the circularity of the discussion is when you talk about uh, the difference between uh, being a citizen of the planet uh, or being a citizen of the cosmos. Going back to ancient Greece, uh, the same discussion was held. Uh, I, I talk at this and Eugen in a way. And to me, the gesture of being a citizen of the cosmos bring, brings us to this atomic uh, formation, the multicellular life that we all are. Mm -hmm. And that's uh, a beautiful thing to take from all of your presentations, looking at the mountain and materiality. So thanks for that. Chris, let me give you the last words then to to close. To close, yeah. yeah. Um, well, thank you so much to all of you for coming, and um, well, once again, thanks to the British Academy, to um, Gabriela. There she is. Many thanks, Gabriela, for all your help. Gabriela, for being in Paso without um, Gabriela's help to all our friends and, and this entire workshop. Um, well, um, have a wonderful evening and thank you so much for coming. Okay.